Here at Alternate Reality, we have always believed that kids are the future of this industry, and that's why I have the largest kids selection of any other store anywhere. Come on down to Alternate Reality, and you'll find comics and trade paperbacks on Pixar characters like Toy Story and Cars, Muppets, Disney, Simpsons, DC and Marvel characters, of course, like Tiny Titans, Scooby-Doo, Spider-Man, and Marvel superheroes. I also have a large selection of girls' comics and girls-related trade paperbacks, as well as illustrated classics and a whole lot more. Readers are leaders, so come on down to Alternate Reality with your little one and pick up some comics that both of you can enjoy. The boys will now talk about last week, and they call it Shop Talk. I said they just can't face the future. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> sure, they're empty news calories, but they're fun and delicious. It's Week in Review Shop Talk for March 9th, 2011. Hey folks, how you doing? Comic Book Man here. Welcome to my video outhouse. It's time for Week in Review, Shop Talk Edition. And this is the Week in Review for March the 9th, 2011. We're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to talk about, oh, we're going to talk about oh. expensive comics. We're going to talk about Jack Kirby getting the shaft. We're going to talk about Doctor Who. We're talking about Mountains of Madness. And to talk with me about all this stuff and more, we've got Ooh, with us in the Shop today. Talk today. Oh, look who's here. Oh, look who's here. It's Bo. It's Bo. It's Bo. Hey, Angry Bo. How you doing? I'm fine. Oh, okay. He's not angry today. <laughs> Why am I here? I was, I, Where I was is the shop talk? I was at shop home. Shop talk. Here, here. Let me, let me remind you. Shop talk. <laughs> I was at home eating a chocolate sundae. First story we've got up in shop talk. We're gonna we're gonna cover a little bit of a little bit of news that I didn't cover in week in review because Genius here who was sitting right behind me for the whole damn thing. If you don't believe me, watch it. I was busy. You don't believe me, watch it. He didn't mention this to me at all. It totally went over my head. Bo, what do you got there? DC shipped two books this week. What is so similar about these covers? Look, it's people holding dead people. People holding dead people. It's people holding dead people week at DC. Well, although one of them's not really dead, it makes this issue a cheat. Well, he's going to get away. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it was people holding dead people week at DC. Be sure and to check crying. that out. Like, oh. Come on down to your alternate reality or check it out at your local comic book shop and see people holding dead people looking all sad. You know, they get awfully you, stinky after Oh, do you bring your work home with you? Never. <laughs> you don't want to know about it, folks. It you don't want to know about it. Okay, our first big story up is Wallop and Web Snappers. Wallop and Web Snappers. We had a Spider Man, a copy of Spider Man, Amazing Fantasy 15, a 9.6 graded copy, sell for $1.1 million this week, which is a record, obviously, for Amazing Fantasy 15, but it's also a record because this is the very first Silver Age comic to be sold for over a million dollars. As a matter of fact, the last time a copy of Amazing Fantasy 15 sold, it was a 9.4 condition copy it was also slabbed and it sold for two hundred twenty seven thousand dollars so in the last year this one is two tenths of a point better than that last one but it sold for a million one <laughs> nicholas cage bought it right is that crazy or what is nicholas cage nine, bought nine, it eight, nine eight though no it's nine six. Oh, nine six. Charlie the one that sold it? for 1.1 1. 1 is Who nine six it? Uh, they didn't say. They didn't say. This was a this was a comic craft auction, comiccraft.com, comic connect auction. I'm sorry, dot com. Uh, and the word is that this is probably the finest copy of this book that is in existence at this time that we know of. That we know of. Of course, there could always be something out there in somebody's attic, sealed away. But as far as people are concerned, and there there are probably a couple of thousand of these floating around out there. But this is the best condition copy that's that's been out there. Bo, would you pay that much for a copy? Maybe oh, hell fifty. No. <laughs> You're insane. Maybe Todd McFarlane. Amazing Fantasy 15 originally sold for 12 cents if you were around in 1962 when it first came out. It's a hell of an investment. Uh, sold for 12 cents when it first appeared. Uh, and of course, Amazing Fantasy 15 is the book that launched the Amazing Spider Man to the world. And, and was the series was canceled like right after that issue. And we went right into the Amazing Spider Man. Do you remember what else was in it? Uh, there was a backup store, uh, backup store, I think by Ditko. It was one of those monster things, I okay. think. Fing, you know, fang, fool. Gagoom, son of Gagom, Gagoom. or something like that. Yeah, thank you, Stan Lee. Gagoom. Uh, Gagoom was a hell of a game. It, or it might have been, it might have been a mystery thing. I don't know, but, but it had nothing to do with Spider Man. There were actually two stories in that book. Spidey's the first half, and then the back half was another one. But the Spidey story was so hot, it, it catapulted him into his own book and, and really salvaged the Amazing Fantasy franchise for that one issue. <laughs> they canceled the series after that. <laughs> Save me! Uh, yeah. uh, just just for the record, last year, okay, that last year, for those of you who have forgotten, a uh, copy of Action Comics number one sold for over a million dollars, and Detective Comics twenty seven also sold for over a million dollars. I believe the Superman, the Action Comics was one point five million. Uh, Batman wasn't quite as much; it was one point 
two million, I think, or something. But those are both Golden Age comics, and there are very few of those in existence, and there was Amazing Fantasy 15. This, obviously, you know, sold, being much newer and having more copies in existence, I think it sold this for this much because it's Amazing Spider-Man, and it's no longer a comic book. It, it's it's a cultural icon. It's a touchstone. It's a piece of actual memorabilia from, from our... our Shared history. Yeah, if you're paying that much for it, you'll never open again. Yeah, as 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 opposed to you know stuff like this, which ain't never going to be worth that much. Money. What? <laughs> <laughs> you have any uh, any great thoughts on that, Bo? That's really way too much to pay for a comic. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> they didn't say who uh, who bought it last George year. Bush. Last year they didn't reveal who. Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey last year they didn't reveal who the who the buyers were for the action, action or the, the detective. detective. I think it came out later, uh, within a couple of weeks. But when the auction actually happened, they didn't reveal who it was. They haven't revealed yet for Amazing Fantasy 15. Do we really want to know? We'll find out at some point. I'd like sure. to know. Sure. I don't want to know. Because I may want to have them smacked or hit or something. Okay. The next big story that came out this week, comic book story, uh, is about the Jack Kirby Stan or Marvel Comics. Uh, copyright lawsuit that's been kicking around the courts now for quite some time. Uh, there's a big story that came out on that this week. Bo, why don't you take it? Because you're very familiar with the story. Bo, who's familiar with the story, will tell us more about it. Okay, <laughs> Bleeding Cold basically started this a couple of days ago. They got copies of the depositions that right. were done by Stan Lee, John Romita, Larry Lieber, Roy Thomas, and Mark Evernier. They were made uh, public. You could read them. They got the whole transcripts and listed them. They're actually pretty interesting. The Lee, the Lee was, was really nice because he explained how you, they created the Marvel method. Basically, he said, well, I had artists waiting for books, and so I said, okay, here's a general idea, and do it. Yeah. Uh, and it got to the whole big, massive explanation of how certain characters were invented. We found out that the Silver Surfer was not a was something that Kirby threw in the back of a Fantastic Four, and he asked him, Jack, what the hell is this? And he goes, I don't know. And then Kirby, <laughs> it, I don't know. just something I just threw in the background. I don't know. I'll figure it out next issue. Right. Now, Marvel's defense in all this is that Stan Lee was the sole creator of all the characters in question and that Jack Kirby's work was considered work for hire, uh, which is something they may actually be able to prove because apparently the people who worked for Marvel at the time said that all the checks that you got from Marvel, on the back of the checks it quite clearly said anything you did by signing this check agreed that everything you turned in and were paid for belonged to the company. Well, it was an actual stamp that they put on the, the the on the back so of right the check. So right where you sign for the check, right. you're signing in a stamp that says, guess what, you're signing away all your you're rights to this thing. Did Stanley get the same deal? <laughs> Stanley got the same deal. Stanley so got his, the same his deal. His checks were stamped the same thing? But, but the difference is they're saying that Stan or the office manager, right. uh, uh, whoever was around at the time, well, they say are, are, are the creators behind all these characters, and Stan has already made his deal with Marvel and is is living quite comfortably until the day he yeah, shuffles fact, off this mortal yeah. coil. Yeah, because Roy Thomas was the editor in chief of Follow Stan Lee, and he yeah. said, and they asked him, well, did any artist ever do any books or any issues without talking to Stan Lee or the office manager? And he went, no. Until Stan them told them what to do, they didn't have anything to do. Yeah. Now, Mark Evernier was there because he was a friend of Jack Kirby's. He yeah. met Kirby when he was 17 years old. And the first thing that the Marvel lawyers hit with is the fact that you know that anything you say about what Jack Kirby says is considered hearsay evidence, and so yeah. therefore it's relatively unimportant. But Ask Drew Peterson about that. <laughs> right. But what's, what's really cool about this is if you, read the, if you read the transcripts, Evernier was a little more combative, but what the Marvel lawyer got Evernier to admit was that Jack Kirby's memory sucked. Jack Kirby did an interview with a newspaper in which he said he created Superman. Jack you're not trying to do. You're not trying to make Marvel do the legal thing. You're trying to make Marvel do the right thing. Well, and that's not going to happen. It's it, it, basically the problem is if you sign the thing for the work for hire. There's no. There's no one to contradict Marvel's story because nobody in the Kirby family is around, yeah. and the Marvel people that are still around, they're saying no. He was all work for hire, and Jack was fully aware of it. And another thing that was interesting about the Evanier thing is he. He said that Kirby had come up with a whole bunch of ideas to revamp Thor, Captain mm -hmm. America, a bunch of stuff that Marvel had no interest in, and that was the main one of the main reasons that Kirby went over to DC with Darkseid, Light yeah. Ray, and all the new God stuff. Yeah. The relationship had gotten bad lately. They also, for a brief point, mm -hmm. talked about the artwork issue, and Larry Lieber, he said that he was outside of the office and Stan and Jack were having a really major league argument. And Stan, and Stan, you know, Stan was in his office and Kirby left and he took his art and he ripped it in half. And he threw it in the garbage can and Lieber says, "Yeah, he would do that sometimes." And we pick it up and tape it together and we take it home. <laughs> so somebody's got taped together too. Right. How right. yeah, about got you? They got a few that aren't ripped up. Yeah. Well, and that and the fact that back then people didn't keep art; they gave it away. Yeah. You went to the office on a tour that, here. That's what makes it collectible. That's the 
It, well, it, back then it wasn't collectible. This was something they were doing because they were getting paid for those pages. Well, a couple of things. That was that. And we're, we're this is sort of getting off topic here, but yeah, that, at DC and at Marvel, that was a very common thing. If you went to visit the offices, and they would actually do not full blown tours, but if you called and said, "Yeah, you know, I really love Superman, or I really love Spider Man," can I can, come, I, to the can I come up? They, they said, "Well, sure. Yeah, why don't sure, you come, come Friday after three? You know, right. not much going on. Right. You go up there, they walk you around. Yeah, here's the bullpen. Here's this. Here's that. Hey, kid, here before you before you leave here, have this piece of art. Yeah. Oh, thank you." You. Yeah, they give you know, these give it away. <laughs> now, Spider-Man. right after they did, right all these depositions were done in December, the judge already threw out the entire claim that Kirby was owed artwork because he said if Kirby wanted the artwork, he could have had it by then, and so therefore yeah. that wasn't part of the lawsuit. So, but uh, yeah, it's, you were talking about the New Gods thing. Uh, that that is sort of common knowledge. That when Stan Lee left Marvel and came to DC, a lot of the New Gods stuff was stuff that he had planned yeah, for Kirby Thor. Or Stan Lee? Jack Kirby, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jesse Stanley. Yeah, Stan, Jack Kirby. When, when Jack when Jack Kirby, Kirby came to came to DC, a lot of the ideas he had for New Gods was stuff that he had planned on doing with Thor or stuff he was planning on doing at Marvel at some point, which either never happened or never got fleshed out or never advanced or never whatever, but he well, never used them. So he used them there. Well, yes, but yeah, he brought the stuff to Lee and Lee went, I have no interest in this. Yeah. So. Okay, I'll take it to DC and they'll make Dark Side out. They'll make Dark Side out. All right, that's uh, comic book news. Media news. Media news. We got two stories. First up, Doctor Who. Doctor Who is coming. God, it takes forever for them to get this. You thing know, up. they're Brits. They work. I don't casually. give a damn. You know, series that take that long, no matter how good it is, at some point people stop caring. It's not Doctor. Who. But anyway, the new season of Doctor Who is scheduled for an Easter premiere, uh, the Saturday before Easter, April the 23rd, 9, 8 Central on BBC America here in the United States. They're going to show it in England an hour earlier, so they'll have seen it. They'll go online, they'll tell us all about it, and they'll go, ha ha, here's how it ends. And then they'll start it here. <laughs> so, but, yeah. if you're online that night, you can find out the ending from your friends in England. So the season will, the season will start with a two-parter. They've got episodes, they've got one about creepy dolls, they've got the uh, Gar- Neil Gaiman episode, which is going to be the fourth episode, which involves the clone doctor. Okay, well, the first, the first episode, the Easter episode, takes place in the 1960s in Utah and the Oval Office, the doctor is going to go to Kennedy. Utah. Kennedy's there. Kennedy is the president. Uh, for those of you who are Doctor Who fans, you know that Doctor Who premiered on the day that a, President Kennedy was assassinated, November 23rd, 1963. So there, there is a connection there with, with Doctor Who and President Kennedy. Uh, and this is going to be in the 1960s, and I, it sounds like it's going to be uh, he's uh, found Area, like area 53, 53. He's, he's 53 there and he's got thing. a beard. Who? Uh, Doctor Who? Oh, he's got you've a beard. Seen, yeah, oh. the commercial. He's got a beard. He's being chained up in a basement somewhere. <laughs> Great. Uh, rumor is that the second part of that two-part episode, they're going to run the next day on Easter. They haven't confirmed that yet. That may not happen. But the rumor is that they're going to run part one on Saturday, part two on Sunday. Bam, bam, there you go. Uh, and then, as you were saying, uh, the Neil Gaiman episode is going to be fourth. Pirate episode is going to be third. Uh, and there's talking about a uh, two-part uh, cliff, mid-season cliffhanger also. I suppose this is a, yeah, this is a two-part cliffhanger, which they haven't even shot yet. No, they haven't shot yet. But it'll, but it'll have the return of James Corden's character from The Lodger. From the it'll Lodger. also involve the Cybermen. The Cy- oh. I, believe it's Rory, I believe in that episode, Rory and Amy die. God, I hope they get better. Well, no. <laughs> That'll be the second time Rory's died. Uh, meanwhile, Melt them down. meanwhile, Guillermo del Toro got some really bad news this week, which he probably is not very happy about. He and James Cameron are going to do an adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountain of Madness. Universal is going to do it. They looked at the price tag, $150 million. They looked at the fact it's going to be R-rated, and so the people at Universal said, I don't think so. Tom Cruise is just about ready to sign to star in the film. He's still gung-ho about doing it, so Turo assumes that maybe at some point Universal will let him take the project and go somewhere else because this is something he's wanted to do since he started making movies. Well, if they don't want to do it, they might as well want yeah. him to do it. They yeah. might as well. Then again, I can think $150 million for Lovecraft. I've never been a Lovecraft fan, but that's a lot of money. Yeah, there, you know, nobody's ever really done Lovecraft, though. I mean, the way he should be done. Well, I, 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 I saw the Dunwich Horror when I was a kid, and it sucked. How do you see against <laughs> James Cameron, though? Yeah. Until he flags and crashes and burns? Well, Cameron yeah. might end up just, if you're going to give it back to me, I'll finance it myself. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, he certainly has the money to do that. He's got the cash. Uh, last story we have, we're going to move into the UFC MMA arena. This big story that just, just broke. Today. Just before we went up. Today. Uh, on today, on the 12th of March, UFC bought Strike Force. Yes, they now own Strike Force. Really? Yes. All, all the fighters' contracts are still in place. All the shows that they're planning on doing are still set. All the stuff that's going to be showed on Showtime is still, will still be going on and still run on Showtime. They will run it as two completely separate companies. And then at some point when the fighter contracts end at a certain point, yes. they'll be wandering back. Like you've, you've got people who work over at Strike Force that were working at UFC anyway, like Dan Henderson. Mm-hmm. He says he's more than willing to go back. Now, there's some people like Paul Daly, who Dana White said will never work for UFC again. I guess he'll be out bumming 
cigarettes and we can pencil. That's stuff. sad. <laughs> now, USC will promote Strike Force shows. They'll promote live events. They'll do pay per views. And they will also, Strike Force will keep doing the women's division. But Dana White's made it quite clear there aren't enough women out there to make this a big deal. So yep. once their contracts are up, it might be over with. And White himself will not be appearing on camera live at any Strike Force events on Showtime. Okay. People will be there. But this is a story just happened today. So that means if you're talking about MMA in the United States and actually MMA everywhere else, UFC is now king of the entire mountain. That, well, it's sort of like WWE. Yeah. There is there is no one else. Yeah. When, before TNA came along, after WWE bought the uh, w, WCW, yep. they were it. They and were it. UFC, um, UFC already had the uh, Pride video rights. They bought, they bought all the Strike Force stuff. And like the WWE, they're also planning on doing a network. So they've got all this footage out there. What the hell? What the hell? Might as well do it. Uh, any word on what the uh, sale price was? No, they haven't said what the sale price is. They're going to hold a press conference on the 15th to explain all of it and how much it costs, but it probably isn't going to be that much. Well, that's a great story. The guy that started that up in the first place on almost nothing, next yeah. to nothing, yeah. he must have cashed in on he million, Well, he cashed million. in. Well, actually, the guy, the guy who invented the entire concept of UFC... He got about two or three million for it, and he says he's, he's, he's even though he it's worth screwed. a billion now, <laughs> he says he would do the deal again because he said at the point that I was sold it, nobody was nobody gave a crap. Yeah. So. Well, and he couldn't he couldn't right. expand it beyond where it went. And the guy who owns uh, Strike Force, Scott Coker, he's actually he owns the HP Arena in San Jose and a whole bunch of other stuff. So Scott Coker's getting off like a fat rat. <laughs> that's lovely. what let the blood flow lovely lovely and that's it we're done we're finished out of here that's it for week in review but you can see more weeks in review at the store's website as well as his news and dan's reviews and jr's media news and a whole host There's of what? other things media news media reviews no media news yeah. JR doesn't do media news. I oh, mean, that's right. Well, he does it here. I'm sorry. He does it here. Check out the website. But check it out. Go and look at it. And, of course, the store's website is at... Tell Sarah him. knows where all the stuff is. It's at tell him where it is. www.myalternatereality.com. No, no it's tell. not. Sarah, tell us. Yeah, see? You still haven't figured out what it is yet? www.myalternatereality.com. So, go to the store's website, check it all out. Until next time, this is Comic Book Man. I'm a busy man. I don't have time to watch this. I do it, I walk away, it's over with. Reminding you, it's people holding dead people we get to see. Be sure to stop by and take part in this wonderful event. Bye! Don't make them dead. The Video Outhouse is brought to you by some of the finest people willing to work for free. This is a list of some of them.